think there's recognition that there is a genuine housing crisis. And the reason we're in a tough position is, is essentially we have had a cut in funding through much of the last 10 years. I do think financially, social care is the most pressing issue. Welcome back to the PSU podcast, giving you views, insight and conversation with leaders from across the public sector. I'm your host, Dan Ben. Today we welcome Chairman of the Local Government Association, Councillor James Jameson, onto the podcast. Councillor Jameson was first elected to Central Bedfordshire Council in 2009, where he served as a Chair of Scrutiny before being elected as a leader following the elections in 2011. He currently represents the Westerning Ward, having previously represented Flitwick. James was elected leader of the LGA Conservative Group in 2018 before going on to be elected as the LGA Chairman in the summer of 2019. So welcome, James. It's nice to have you on. How are you doing? I'm doing very well, but uh, to be fair to my local residents, I should say Flitwick rather than ah, Flitwick. Apologies, apologies. Um, so obviously the environment and the current environmental emergency is a big focus for everyone at the minute, especially those in central and local government. And one of the many ways that local governments are going about reducing the amount of carbon emissions in their areas by reducing those coming from housing. But there's also a big housing crisis in a lot of places, including London. Do you think that the homelessness crisis could be impacting the amount of focus that councils are putting on, ensuring that housing, the housing is meeting their net zero standards? Um, well, I think it's a much broader question that because there is huge pressure on councils overall, whether it's with social care, adult uh, services, uh, children's services, homelessness, housing and so forth. So we've got a lot on our plate and I wouldn't like to single out any one area that is causing problems. But quite clearly, uh, all councils pretty much up and down the country uh, are focused on net zero. We're very keen to achieve net zero, uh, but you're right to say that there is also a housing crisis, and we would always seek to avoid any compromises. But you know, the life of politics is about choices, and sometimes those choices are difficult. Absolutely, um, and a bit like meeting those, those targets in housing as well. There's big decisions to be made just to achieve net zero in their areas that uh, you mentioned there, that they've got big decisions to make and things to weigh up. And we all know that they're, they're all working extremely hard on making sure that, that they reduce the carbon emissions in their areas. But do you think that enough's being done to actually meet the target? I think councils are very ambitious to hit that target. And certainly we've been talking with government uh, and asking them uh, to help us more. And, and that's not just please, can we have more money? I think it's much more than that. Uh, and I was very pleased with the Chris Skidmore review into net zero. Uh, council's got very prominent mention there. And there they put some very important things that I think are really important, which is this is about the long term. It's about certainty. So, for instance, we talk about insulating homes and having a program to insulate homes. But you can't do that on the back of short term funding. So if you look at how much government has funded for insulation, we can have a debate whether it's enough or not, but it has regularly put money on the table, but it's never said well in advance, here is the money for the next 10, 15, 20 years, which is what would allow councils, contractors, education providers to invest in capacity, to invest in skills, and to start thinking about, well, how do we insulate this whole row of houses, rather than doing one this year and one next year and one, that's a very inefficient way of doing things. So long-term certainty, both of funding and of regulation. Uh, very interesting if we talk about uh, heating uh, and the use of heat pumps, getting clarity about when uh, gas fire boilers will no longer be allowed is really important. Uh, interesting is talking to some car manufacturers, that real clarity of no new cars with uh, with the combustion engines after 2030 or in other parts of Europe, 2035, has provided a real impetus to invest. We don't have that same clarity uh, in many of the other net zero areas. So, so would you say that 
central government needs to do more to help local authorities meet their goals across the board? Yes. Um, and as I said, that, that's a combination of, of several things. One is much clearer guidelines, not just for us, but for, for the wider community. It's about genuine, long-term, predictable funding so we can all invest. Of course, we'd also like more money, uh, but it's also about deciding which technologies are going to be backed and which ones aren't going to be backed. And it's also partnering with local authorities. You know, we have demonstrated that we can deliver net zero cheaper if we do it on a community place basis than a white all top down. And that's really important. So they need to engage with us as well. Absolutely. Um, I, I was talking to someone who works in electric vehicles uh, and they were saying that there needs to be more clarity from the government in terms of how councils should be spending the money. Yeah. And, and, and it will be different in different places. Uh, I, I literally was just having a cup of coffee with some colleagues in a, in a neighbouring town and, you know, they're looking at putting EV charging points in in the local shop, car park and so forth. Well, actually, in my ward, I've got little rural villages, not really appropriate because we don't have a shop where we can put uh, charges, but actually facilitating people who are living in terraces or, or otherwise don't have a parking spot to charge at home really important. So it's different problems in different places. Absolutely. And moving on to a point we've, we've kind of touched on a little bit uh, with housing. So we, we spoke about the housing crisis and net zero in housing, but with, with the homelessness crisis that, that is ongoing, um, there's been a lot said about London uh, and the homelessness crisis in there. What can local governments do to ensure that they achieve their own housing targets? You know, we can have a long debate about what's the appropriate target and whatever, and there is a wide variety of views on that. I think there's recognition that there is a genuine housing crisis and housing in many parts of the country are not affordable, uh, particularly in London. Uh, and, you know, the only way that we're going to fix that is by providing sufficient uh, housing. And I think that's that's the real driver uh, that I think we need to do is how do we deliver more housing, but how do we deliver more housing that is appropriate, that's the right sort of housing, that has the right infrastructure. And I think one of the frustrations for a lot of the local government sector is if we've had a lot of planning reforms where councils were seen as the problem. And, you know, frankly, we're not the problem. You know, there's 340 odd councils across the country. Not everyone's going to be perfect. But by the way, they will be much better than centrally driven um, government. But, you know, we need the support. So this is, again, about how do we ensure the infrastructure? How do we ensure the schools? How do we ensure quality accommodation? You know, how do we ensure that it's housing for local people? That's, that's a frustration. So, again, if I talk about my own ward, um, you know, we're building a lot of large detached houses and yet the residents in my ward would like their children to live there. Well, I'm sorry, your starter home is not going to be a five bedroom million pound house. Uh, interestingly, I talked to some people uh, in central London where there's a lot of one and two bed uh, apartments. And actually, if you want to have a family, there aren't the three bed apartments, you know, that, that people can access. You know, they need to go and buy a townhouse, which is just way out of reach. So. It's about how do we support local councils to deliver what their communities need? And, and I think, you know, lots of people talk about NIMBYs. The reason that people object so much to housing is they can't get an appointment at the doctors. They see their roads being more crowded. They can't get a place for school. You know, they see their parks becoming overcrowded. If we could provide all of those things, uh, then I think that would be much better. And that's why I, I am actually hopeful of the latest planning reforms because they do move in that direction. So they move in the direction of giving slightly more powers to councils, that there is talk of um, you know, higher, um, sorry, more of the land value uplift coming to councils to help fund uh, some of that essential infrastructure. So, you know, I consider the new planning reforms to be a positive step. They don't fix everything. 
But after 10 years of, of reforms going in the wrong direction, I think at least we're now moving in the right direction. Yeah, um, and uh, earlier on today, I was I was covering the news, um, and I saw something from the London Assembly about um, the planning reforms and kind of their response to it. And it was very much they they appreciate the ambition of it, but there just needs to be a little bit more clarity. Um, and I I can completely see where where both you and and they're coming from. Uh, also today, I was um, looking at the Brown Brownfield Land Release Fund. Yes. Um, and I, I was I was looking into all that. How much does that help when it comes to councils with housing? Well, th- there there are many places, particularly in large urban areas, uh, where there are low housing values, where frankly the land has a negative value, because you know when it's converted to building land, it just doesn't have that much value. And therefore, you can't remediate it. So that's that's a very useful mechanism. And you know, I was talking, I've been talking to people in Manchester and in Stoke about actually they do have sites they could build houses. It's just the cost of making the land worthless, i.e., having zero value, is too high, and so people aren't prepared to build. So being able to take those sites, and that's surely got to be better if we can reme- remediate a a uh, brownfield site that has environmental issues with it that is contaminated that has to be better than building on a greenfield yeah um I, I completely agree with you there and, and kind of everything we've spoken about so far in terms of net zero as well if you've got if you're destroying greenfield land to put houses up you're, you're reducing that that green space that is important to a lot of a lot of places in net zero targets so Onto kind of the, the final little section, um, and it's a massive thing at the minute. From what I'm seeing, uh, you may disagree, but it's funding um, and local government funding. With the current cost of living crisis and the, and the financial situation, how do you see local councils faring at the minute? Local councils are in a tough position, and, and the reason we're in a tough position is is essentially uh, one because we have had. A, a cut in funding uh, through much, much of, of the last 10 years. Uh, but also we have demographic pressures that means our costs are going up significantly more than inflation. So fantastic news that we're all living longer. Uh, I'm a big supporter of that. But that actually means we need to spend far more on social care. Um, we are finding that we are spending more money on children's social care. Now, some of that is demographic and some of that uh, is some very sensible, some some good reforms, shall we say, that is looking to support, send children and so forth better, but that costs money. So both in children's and adult social care, we we are seeing growth well in excess of, of GDP or inflation, uh, and that's an issue that we have. It's a it's an underlying issue. We're not dissimilar to the health service that demography is is driving our cost base. So we have that that twin pincer. Um, to be fair to government, the settlement we just received was better than it pretty much everyone was expecting. Um, we as the LGA identified that if we compared when we got the original settlement in November 21 to you know, last summer, we had seen a cost inflation rise of around 2.4 billion current year and something around 3, 3.5 billion in 20. 324. Actually, the settlement for next year pretty much covers that inflation element, um, assuming councils take their full uh, council tax rise, and doesn't address the shortfall in year. So am I am I dancing in the streets? Absolutely not. But I do recognise that that has been a decent settlement for local government, but it doesn't remove all our pressures. It doesn't remove the underlying pressures. Uh, the second thing is long-term certain funding, you know, and and that's not just about the main funding. That's about all the small grants we get, you know, whether it's public health, whether it's better care fund, um, whether it's every winter we get some funding for winter pressures. If we knew what those grants were going to be two, three, four years out, we could actually have a long-term strategy, we could invest in the workforce, we could invest in assets. 
So I think one of the things that I keep pressing government for is clearly I need more money. But actually, even if there isn't more money, can we have certainty? Because we can we can deliver much more effectively uh, with certainty. And then actually, if times are tough, government, how about you start giving more stuff to local government, genuine devolution, because we will deliver better, more effectively, more uh, efficiently than central government. So just hand over more stuff to us with your current expenditure on it, uh, and that will help us and it will help the country. Yeah, and you, you mentioned devolution there as well. Um, that's a big thing at the minute. Um, I, I've covered it uh, a fair bit, and I've, I've not been in, in the sector for years and years, but I know how important it is. And how hopeful are you that the more devolution deals get get put forward and get agreed, that this control goes back to the communities that know where the money is needed? I'm an optimist. So you have to be in politics sometime. Uh, so there's lots of talk about devolution. The devolution framework uh, that Michael Gove produced uh, last summer, I think, is a good framework. But what we're seeing with the current deals has to be seen as a starting point, because this can't just be about, well, here's some extra money. It's got to be about real de devolution, real decision making, real control over, you know, skills, elements of community and local health, um, local transport schemes, you know, more control over planning, more place shaping, because at the end of the day, we all want to live in great places. And the more that we can make the key decisions locally, the better those places are going to be. And just to kind of move back a little bit to funding sites, from your point of view, how can those councils that are struggling a little bit more get through this, this financial situation as unscathed as possible, whilst still ensuring they're delivering the services? Well, every council is doing its damnedest to support its residents. Now, no two places are alike, and that means the pressures that different places face are different. And one of the things that we have seen, and we were talking earlier, is the big, the big cost pressures are in adult social care and in children's services. Well, not surprisingly, the biggest pressures will be in places that have the most or the highest proportion of old people and the highest proportion of young people. Well, that that is not you know uh, the same across the country. Uh, we also talk about the ability to raise council tax, which varies. So one of the things that we are pushing for is that we do need fair funding that is evidence-based and supports all the councils across the country with the amount of funding that they need to support their residents. Um, now, at the same time, uh, the LGA um, has a peer support and does a lot of support for councils. And there are councils who are having tough times. And some of that is money, but some of that is how can we help you uh, you know, make those difficult decisions and get through this together because we are a sector, we are a family, uh, and we do need to help each other. Yes, um, I would be inclined to agree with you with that one. Um, so just to kind of close out uh, one final point, uh, as we move further into 2023, obviously the time of recording, what is the one thing that you think is going to be the most pressing issue for local authorities to deal with this year? People complain sometimes that, that I go on too much about it, but I do think financially social care in the short term is the most pressing issue. And, you know, if you look at the moment with all the issues with hospital uh, and delayed uh, operations and whatever, which has a knock on impact, because if you have somebody who hasn't had an operation, then they will tend to need more care and a higher level of care. So from a cost point of view, I think that is really important. But if I then stand back a bit and say, you know, what, what really matters? And to me, place is what always matters. And place is about, you know, having great places for people to live. It's having, building great communities. It is about the environment. It's about net zero. 
and it's about having high quality housing. And a lot of the, the bigger issues that we face in the long term, I think, can be addressed by place. Um, you know, having the right home in the appropriate location, having a community around you, having support around you, having a great job that preferably you could walk or cycle to rather than commute. You know, having a great park, having somewhere safe for your children to go out and enjoy, having a, you know, a community where as you get older, you can go out and socialize and, and meet people and, uh, you know, not be lonely and, and miss out. That, that to me is the great opportunity. And that's part of devolution. It's part of the housing agenda. It's part of a whole load of things. That to me is the most exciting opportunity. But if you ask for a short term worry, it is social care of adults and children and the impact of the health service. But if we work with government or government rather works with us, I think there's much we can do in that area. Thank you very much for that. Um, thank you very much for the entire episode, James. I'm sure our audience will learn a lot from your insight. Um, I've definitely learned a considerable amount, including the, the correct pronunciation of flitic. Um, so that's everything for this episode. Thank you for listening and goodbye. Thanks very much. Bye.